Lovely to see you all here. Thank you, and thank you for an absolutely beautiful film. Now, Finola, this is a very universal story, but I think in the genesis of this becoming a, a film that it was also something deeply personal to you. Was that right? Yeah, it absolutely was. I read the novel um, very early after it came out. I absolutely loved it. It was my mother's story, my story, and over time, the more I thought about it, it was, I thought, actually, it's a very universal story. It's so many people's stories that you end up living somewhere other than where you grew up. Short and sweet. <laughs> no, I can keep going forever. No. <laughs> Thank you. But, Short answer. Colin, did, what was your biggest anxiety, if you had one, about the book's translation into a film? Um, I think there were... Um, the, the, the world she navigates, that Saoirse navigates in the book, is one, or I, Ailey, you know, is where so many people are so kind to her in one way and so unpleasant to her in others. And that, uh, that, that I suppose, um, that, that amount of flavour that comes in the book from tricks of speech, from, uh, you know, all, all that way in which someone's face moves, that was something that... Um, I, th I think the picture captures better than the book in certain ways, where so, someone like Breach Brennan, as she the minute she appears, you know, it would take a novelist five pages to get that level of bitterness, nastiness, unpleasantness, <laughs> and pure determination. You know, whereas Breach just turns her face <laughs> and you get it. So, you know, that, that, that sort of thing, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing to watch somebody being able to do in a second, what it would take me two weeks and with a lot of erasure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sir, shall we think of you as a bit more sophisticated and certainly better traveled than Elish, but um, you were at that exact right age of transitioning from adolescence into real pro a, a, a young woman. And of course, you have connections with Ireland and New York, but were there, mm -hmm. was there some particular thing that really connected you or really that, that you really responded to in, in her above all else? Uh, yeah, I, I really do feel um, <clears throat> the, the weight that you experience, the heaviness that you experience when you're homesick. Um, and you leave home for the first time and haven't quite settled anywhere and are sort of floating between these two different places and you can't quite go back to where you're from, but you're not quite settled in this place that you're moving towards either. And there is definitely that sense of loss and vulnerability, I think, and you don't really know when that's going to be lifted. And <clears throat> from the time that I had met John initially, to discuss the script when we actually made the film, which was a year later, I had moved away. And so I was right in the middle of, the, of that feeling and the heaviness that Colm and Nick describe so well through their writing, you know? So it, it, I guess I, you can kind of liken it to reading a book or listening to a piece of music or watching a film yourself that just completely speaks to you and for whatever reason, you feel like you're going to be connected to it for life. That's how it felt sort of with every scene that we shot. And that was quite unusual for me to not be able to, to turn off my emotions at the end of the day, you know. Wow. Thank you. John, after your extensive theatre career, I imagine working with actors is meat and drink to you, and that wasn't the big daunting thing. But um, even though, of course, you've worked on screen before and with distinction, this is a huge thing, shooting in three countries with a transatlantic cast and recreating another era. What was the biggest challenge for you? Um, well, just what you say, it was three <laughs> countries. You know? I mean, it, it, it is, it's true, because we, had, uh, we essentially had three crews. So we had a, we had a core crew, which remained the same. Um, uh, but Saoirse was the only actor who you know, was consistent to the whole thing. So, so in, a, in a strange way, the shoot had um, sort of multiple personalities. You know, the Irish section was, was very distinct in its own way, and then the Montreal section was its own thing, and then the New York one was its own way. So it was kind of appropriate for what she goes through, which is, um, but we were, you know, shooting out of order, and that was, was challenging when you're trying to do um, something which is a very subtle transformation from um, uh, a rather pale young girl into um, uh, a rather beautiful young woman who's very sure of what she's about or is arriving into what she's about by the end of the story. Um, and, and judging all of that um, in, you know, out of order, trying to get, make sure that all the pieces of the mosaic would, would be right to be laid out, um, took a bit of thought. Thank you. Nick, you're not Irish and you're not a girl, but my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> you're on a role writing good women's roles. I, 
what particularly sort of sang to you? What element did you most want to focus on? Well, I saw the chance to um, produce a screenplay that um, was extremely mm -hmm. beautiful um, and uh, sort of uh, classic, I suppose, and, and that sort of thing doesn't come along every day. Um, <clears throat> and also, there's there is well, there, there was wonderful minor characters, which is something that I look for, and this enormous technical challenge of of persuading people that uh, actually Ailish is properly split, um, and and. Uh, that was an enormously interesting thing to try and convey. Thank you. Okay, let's open it up now. Um, we've got microphones. Who has it? Okay, one, two, somebody over here, three, and <coughs> we'll do, start there. Okay, go ahead. Hi. Oh, hi. Can you hear me? I can't yep. tell. <laughs> yes. Um, this is a question for Sersha. Sorry, first of all, I'm a UK freelance. And I'd just like to put to you that um, dating in, in the 50s, was just about the polar opposite to what it is in the 21st century. Yeah. And would you, would you it like to... It is all right. Eh? <laughs> it is all right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, would you like to see a return to that sort of quite old-fashioned romance, um, a charm to it, but also quite buttoned up? Or do you think, in the busy world that we live in, that dating apps, websites, and social media is the romantic way forward? You mean, so you mean in real life, not in, re in film? In real life, no, not in movies. Um, I, to be honest, I think it's a very personal thing, you know? People can get quite judgmental about, or prejudice even, to how other people find each other and develop relationships. And it is scary that technology is kind of taken over as much as it is. Um, and, it, you know, it's become part of every aspect of communication, which is kind of terrifying. I think the thing that, and it's not, it's really a personal choice to just um, kind of make a point of focusing on the person that's right in front of you, this physical thing that's right in front of you instead of looking at a screen. And for me, that's that's very important for me. Um, I think the ro the romantic side of courting and kind of, you know, we see with Eilish and Tony that they have to follow certain steps. Um, one leads on to the next thing and leads on to the next thing and leads on to marriage and leads on to sex and leads on to babies and all that sort of stuff. And there there is a beautiful kind of romanticism to that and knowing that you have to sort of follow this along the way, even though you've got this bubbling excitement and chemistry and all these different feelings underneath the surface. Um, so I think there's something quite exciting about that. But I think it's a, it's, it's a very personal thing for everyone, you know. Um, so I suppose this is for Com and, and John and, and Nick and maybe all of you. Um, be, when I read the book, I personally, this might just be me, but I personally felt much more drawn to, if I was Eilish, uh, I would feel much more drawn to Brooklyn than to Ireland. But in the movie, I felt like it was much more... Um, I was much more torn, you know. I was sitting there and I was thinking, well, because I feel like in the movie... Oh, okay, I can go on, I won't. Um, I, but I was just wondering if it was intentional that you worked to make the movie more, um, you worked to make the Irish part of her life more attractive, or if that sort of came naturally, that you tried to balance it? Well, no, we did work very hard for that, and, and all the way right through the edit, to try and balance those two elements, because that's why you have a film, and, and you know the, that sort of conflict is, it's either very sharp, in a film or else it would be rather flat and if it's tilted in one direction it wouldn't work as well as drama and um, I always had a, a you know a secret wish for one outcome but you can't you have to sort of put that away somehow what was your wish? I'm not telling you <laughs> <coughs> and John and I had the same wish no it felt t the, the film the film the film you know t t tips our hat in that direction I mean I felt that that um, she did the right thing to go back to America but our task, and Donal was really helpful with this, actually, when he, when he came on board, and um, uh, it was to make sure that, that you know, what, what's a rather odd thing to do, which is to get you to invest in a, in a relationship romantically for the first hour of a film, and then to park it, and then say, now here's this other guy, and to get to an equal place of investment 
with a sort of shorthand in sort of three, maybe four scenes, which Nick did so deftly, um, without an audience going, uh, God, she's a cow, you know, <laughs> that, that is somehow how you, you know how to get that and feel her dilemma um, was, was the task, you know, so that, so yeah, believe me, that took a, a, a lot of blood, sweat and tears. Yeah. Um, opinion is really divided. I mean, I, I mean, I mean, it isn't as though if someone reads the book, everybody has the same view. I mean, they really don't. Mm. The, uh, the thing that, uh, that, uh, that I felt mattered is the wedding scene, is a scene where you see them in the, now I've started to think about it as a film rather than a book, but, but in the book, <laughs> but in the book it's quite important that they're actually with their families in the local church watching a wedding and you can see what's going through her mind. This could be me. I could be enclosed by all these people who love me, by this community I know, and this would mean something to me, rather than being alone in a world I don't know. And, and for, those, for those pages, I think, there, well, certainly there are a lot of readers who think, oh, she's going to do anything to stay. <laughs> and then the other thing happens. But uh, you know, it, it, it isn't as though every reader has the same response to the book. I think, you can, you, sorry, I was just going to say, I think um, when you're reading the book and you see how little is left in the book, when she meets Jim, you think there is no way that I'm going to be persuaded that she should stay in Ireland. And Colm's extraordinary achievement is that in the little space that he has left in the book, he persuades us that they are viable alternatives to each other. And like John said, the, in, the real technical challenge, when, you, when you're writing a screenplay and making a movie, the few pages that Colin gave himself are actually reduced way beyond that even. And we had to find all of us, me and John and, and Donal, a way of presenting Donal, Jim, as a proper suitor for Saoirse. Lady here needs the mic. Thank you. Hello, uh, French web critic. Um, I have a question for you, John and Sawyer, um, about the light and the costumes, which are really beautiful, especially the yellow dress. Um, I wanted to know how did you work, John, on the costumes, uh, the fashion of this time, to be able to, to see the difference between uh, island fashion, uh, Brooklyn, and uh, you, Sawyer. What was your relationship with these costumes? So this fashion, do you want to keep dress like that? Well, <coughs> Odile Dix Miro, who did the costumes beautifully, um, uh, you know, didn't need to be taught how to do her job by me. My, my one thing that I kept stressing was they had to be clothes, not costumes. Because you're dealing with a period which, especially in the American side, where pop culture was just beginning to sort of take hold of people who had a little bit of disposable income, i.e. the girls in the boarding house, right? So there was a little bit of fun that could be had there. But it was very important in the first section that it actually be held in a very tight rein, colours and the nature of the, the costumes, in order that when Saoirse comes back for the third section, it's a bit like one of the Kennedys returning home to Ireland, that there's, <laughs> in, you know, with just one extra dress maybe and, and, a, and a hairdress, that there's a sense of glamour about mm -hmm. her, but that it must be a real person who's seen the movies as opposed to looking like a movie. So that was always the sort of guiding star for us, was, was realism, you know. And there's a confidence as well that she holds with these clothes, I think, when she comes back. And that's what I noticed when I watched the film. I mean, Odile and I mapped everything out. and It was very much down to her, kind of, you know, um, where we took us. But I think, you know, the great thing about our, our whole team was that everyone approached it in a very similar way and someone described it the other day as quite a delicate film and I think that even with the progress when it comes to her look it's all quite delicate and it's all quite gradual and it's only really when she goes back to Ireland that we see suddenly how much you know pop colours she's wearing in her clothes and she has sunglasses on and I even remember when I was younger I wouldn't wear sun I had to think about sunglasses where I thought oh no that's too flashy at home, you know, maybe just because the sun doesn't exist at home, we don't, <laughs> we don't need sunglasses. <laughs> but uh, but that's a very confident thing, you know. You need to be able to hold yourself in order to wear those kind of outfits. Um, and so we had mapped that out. And you know, I really, I'm always very drawn to greens and blues, and I always thought that was quite important because it it 
it suited me but also it represented kind of the journey that she had gone on with you know I just like the idea of it representing land and water and all that sort of stuff and so we worked in that way with the with the colour palette as well um but also what was so lovely Odile and I loved this is that you know the 50s outfits were so womanly and it encouraged women as opposed to now it encouraged women to have curves and a bum and boobs and all that stuff and we just, you know girls are so strongly encouraged to be almost waif like now and not have any shape at all and at that time it was healthier you know so it was great for all the girls to have like proper bras and a big skirt and you know it, it definitely put you into that uh that mindset of a woman in the 50s I hope you kept that green swimsuit. That's a knockout. I mean, <laughs> I wanted it desperately, but... It's going to be an Irish national treasure. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's going to be the new Irish flag, actually. <laughs> yeah. Who else has got a question? Yes, ma'am. The, the new Irish flag. <laughs> Still damp. <laughs> say. Hello, I'm Juliana from BR Press, Brazil. And it's for Sorcy. I would like to know if you live in Ireland, if you still live in Ireland, and if you do, why? And if you don't, why as well? <laughs> um, I do live in Ireland at the minute. As I said, when, when we were making the film, I was living over here and tried it out over here. And, you know, London will always have been the city that, um, that I guess really changed me and gave me the independence that I needed. And... Um, and yeah, and so I, I went back home for a little bit just because of work and things like that. I knew I wanted to move to a different city, but uh, that that will always be my base no matter what. But I'm actually moving to New York in January, so I'm doing the full circle. I was born there, then moved back home, and now I'm going back again. And it's funny because New York always felt like the right place for me to be. You know, I left when I was three. Um, but that always felt like, it felt like it was inevitable that one day, of course, I'd move back to New York and I think I realized recently that New York and Ireland complement each other so well you know maybe just because so much so many of us are over there but um Ireland offers us Ireland offers me what it offered Eilish that that sense of home and childhood and security and all that that nowhere else will will ever offer me and New York is very much the place that I want to be while I'm young so thank you yes sir do you have a um Yes. <laughs> That's better. Um, mm -hmm. Congratulations on a fantastic film. Um, my question is to Saoirse. Um, obviously, your wonderful male co-stars are notable in their absence today. I wondered if yeah. you can talk a little bit about your experience working with both of them and, and about the conflict of identity that these two characters represent. Yeah, um, well, yeah, the... the the unusual thing about having these two male characters in this story, it's, you know, we've seen it a few times in in um, films over the past few years where there's a girl and she's torn between two hunks or whatever and it's like, which one is hotter? But with this, they, they, they represent something. The two of them represent these two very, very different worlds. And I think what's lovely about it and what I hope helped... Emery and Donal is that they they represent a life to her, you know, um, and and they're both wonderful young men and both very sincere in how they feel and what they want. And I think she responds to that um, with both of them, you know, and and yeah, I mean to work. I mean, I had known Donal from years ago and there's been like three films that we were supposed to do together and we never got to do so we were kind of destined to work together at some stage but um we work in a very similar way and uh had a laugh on set and he's just like he's all about getting giggles out of us all the time he doesn't really want to work seriously at all but um it's amazing it's, it's amazing it's amazing he he's a career at all does he get paid for this <laughs> um but uh but no it was so great to have him there and then by the same token to work with someone like Emery who you know works in a very different way to me and does an awful lot of preparation beforehand and really uh not that I don't but takes it very seriously you know and and really went in with an idea of what he wanted to do and um I think to have that sort of yin and yang dynamic 
between us in real life was actually really great for the, the dynamic of the characters because they really have to bounce off each other and uh and I think that's the attraction there is that they're very they come from very different worlds and yet in spite of that they they really want each other you know so um so yeah it was it was a pleasure to work with with both of them yeah yes ma'am Hi, I'm Stephanie Bunry from Australia. My question's for Nick. Um, you are a novelist, uh, adapting another novelist's work. I can barely imagine how terrifying that must be. Uh, and to to discuss it, maybe not discuss it, can you say something about the process of doing that? Um, well, I think um, it's very frightening because the book is so loved and... Um, so special to its readers um, and so of course there's a kind of tension about are we, are we going to mess this up um, but Colin was so uh, incredibly generous and um, hands off in a way that uh, is, was so wise I think having been adapted as well, I think that the only sensible course of action is uh, to decide that you trust the people who are making the film and then let them get on with it. And we met once and Colm told me that um, I shouldn't say rashers of bacon, I should just say rashers. And um, there, there were a couple of other things mammy, like mammy, that, yeah. mammy and mummy. <laughs> and, uh, and that was pretty much it as far as consultation <laughs> <laughs> um, That's true. And, uh, and it, we all seem to still be friends as a result, so um, <laughs> it, it worked out pretty well. The fact that he's here is testament to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's very refreshing Still to friends. have a novelist who's pleased with one. Yeah, but I, I, mean, I should say, when, I, when we met that time, you had written this, basically the script. I mean, I wasn't meeting him beforehand to tell him what I thought he should do. <laughs> I was reading the script just to say, there are two tiny things, and otherwise, thank you. You've done a wonderful job. So that's really what we met for. And it, was, it was lovely to have two things you know, to say. We say mommy, you say mommy. <laughs> yeah. you know, that's got to be... And another thing. I ignored both of them. <laughs> <laughs> Polly? Another question for Sasha. Um, how was it having the fantastic Julie Walters as your, your um, landlady? Yeah. Was there lots of corpsing? Um, During filming, I meant. <laughs> no, no, I mean, she's brilliant. I just kept picturing dinner ladies the whole time <laughs> and she would go into it quite a bit when we were before we would do a take she'd do a little thing with her face or she'd like shake a little bit or something, and it would always remind me of dinner ladies and I think we were all just there in awe that she was in the film at all like it was just you know not that it wasn't good enough or anything, but um, <laughs> <laughs> you know why was she? Why was Thank she in you. it? Um, but she was amazing. She was just brilliant, and she just uh, you realised very quickly how she really she's incredibly humble, and you know as we should all be, but um, very much views herself as just another actor and would fluff up our lines and go, oh, fuck, fuck, you know. Um, and it was great to have someone like that on set. Just you never want egos, and you never want. It, you can really feel it when when somebody's got a very different energy to everyone else. It really affects a set. And um, if anything, she just made it better. And and it was always fun when she was around. And I mean, we did all those dinner scenes in like two days. We had about eight dinner scenes to do. <laughs> we were sick of eating stew by the end of it. Um, but it was terrific to have her there. Yeah. I think um, f visitors from other countries, we should point out that Dinner Ladies is a television program rather than oh, an right, sorry. occupation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got another one. I wanted to ask you if when you were shooting in Enniscorthy, where you're from and your family's from, and it said, did, did the locals have a sort of proprietorial air? Did they sort of keep coming up and... Did they what? Putting their... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Colin, you should talk Well, about I, that. I mean, they've left. N the Nettle Kelly shop will be there for all time. I mean, it's like uh, the castle and the, and the Catholic church, and indeed the Protestant church, they will always be there. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, the, I suppose the idea for a small Irish town, um, Ireland, Ireland has a serious literary culture, 
And um, in a way, every time you throw a stone, you hit a novelist in Ireland. <laughs> but, the, uh, but it doesn't have a strong film culture. So the idea of those streets of Enniscorthy, Court Street, John Street, Lord Church Street, being, being, being in a film for people seemed really important, seemed something that would elevate the town or just give them a sense of the town uh, in a new way. And um, the, the thing they really couldn't get over, the thing they really, or most people I spoke to couldn't believe, was that Saoirse got up at six every morning to work. In the town in general, in my experience of it, and I've been through this myself, if there's someone wandering around in a Scorthy at six in the morning, they've usually been out late. <laughs> you know, and that's fair enough. They're usually on their way home. But the idea of somebody up and ready to work, start your day, and you too at six, I think gave them a whole new sense. So work ethic in Enniscorthy now has broken out. And you see the people of the town, if you go there at six forever. now, you'll see everyone's now marching through the town, ready for their job. The, Shop, you know, the so bread great. man is delivering two hours earlier. The postman, you know, schools are opening. No, really. Yes. Schools are opening. Um, yeah. There was one other film that was shot in Enniscorthy in the 70s, is yeah. that right? And it just had one shot. Was it of yeah, Susan it George? Susan, Susan George. Yes, yeah, Susan bridge. George. And the whole town went down to see her at the bridge and there were comments <laughs> on her regularly. So really, this was the first time in, in living memory that this had occurred. And uh, uh, there were huge crowds. And er also, there were, there were big needs for extras. <coughs> and um, so everybody... I mean, uh, you know, the, the town is small, but I think most of the people wanted to be extras. And those who weren't allowed in wrote to me and it's being shown that there's a screening, I mean, this is a nightmare, there's a screening in the town uh, in, in very soon, and of course everybody wants to come, and only a, no a certain number can come because it's a limited space, so the number of emails I'm getting, my family are getting, could you please <laughs> leave us alone, we don't have any more tickets, if you're listening now, like, we really love you, <laughs> and, and my mother was your mother's best friend, but I cannot <laughs> help, I mean, I cannot do anything more. <laughs> for you. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. <laughs> uh, so this question is for Sarsha. Uh, is that right, Sarsha? Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so um, I I know you probably get this a lot, and it's hard to answer because you were Eilish in the film, and you you can't make that choice. But as for yourself, when you were reading the book or when you were reading the script, um, what what would you do at the end? Like, what do you think you would do? What would I do? Mm. Um, <clears throat> It's tough because I have to say, when reading the book and reading the script and watching the film, um, I could totally justify her staying in Ireland. I can understand the draw. And I think, as Colm said, when you go back to a place, when, when you spend so much time lost in this other place, even if you have found yourself and, and you've started to settle, to then for that to all be thrown up in the air again and go back home to where um, it will always be simple, it will always be, there will be that level of security and it will just be easy in that way. I can understand that completely. Um, I do think I'd, I'd probably go back. It depends on the guy as well, though. <laughs> it depends on the bloke, do you know what I mean? If the guy is nicer in Ireland, then... Um, no, I think I'd probably go back to New York, but... But it's hard to say, you know, it's, I think, you know, like Eilish, once you've had a taste of travel as well, and once you've gotten that confidence after you've, you know, made yourself something in a different place. I mean, that experience in New York is very much her own. It's nobody else's. And she shares it with other people, but it's her that's, that's made it what, what it is through her, her determination and her spirit, you know, um, and that would be hard to give up, I think. I think it's it's quite important um, maybe to point out that it, she only has the choice up until the point where her other life is discovered. Um, and, and there's a little bit of 21st century-ness about saying, well, what would you have done? Because yeah. if you were Eilish at that point and Nettles Kelly knew that you were married back in Brooklyn, that's it, it's over, Ireland is over, and she has to go. But while we maintain the balance, yes, there's, there's a choice. I'm afraid we just have time for one more question. Would, yes, ma'am, jump in. Hello, I'm a freelance interviewer. A question for John and Saoirse. 
Um, you did fabulous physical transformation from greasy skin Dalish to <laughs> confident uh, New Yorker Ailish. Can you tell us a bit about what you did physically to achieve that? I do think the clothes helped. Mm. I do think the clothes were a big part of it, I have to say. Um, heels help as well. Having, mm. Honestly, having to wear high heels instantly make you feel like a woman and you have to kind of be confident in order to carry that off, I think. Um, so that that was very helpful for me. But in terms of emotionally, it yeah. was sort of, you know, y each scene was very clearly scripted by yeah. Nick. So, uh, you know, I always knew what sort of trace emotionally we were after when we were on set shooting that scene, what, what needed to happen in order for it to ring true. Um, and I personally don't tend to work from the outside in, I work from the inside out. Um, so where the character is at all the way throughout reflects that from the sort of slightly mousy young girl at the start to the confident young woman who at the end is able to pass on advice to the other young girl on the boat and kind of see herself, you know, nine months earlier. Um, and she's radically different and... Also, the people that she's interacting with are very different. They're a lot more outward and confident and all that, you yeah. know, when she gets to the States. Yeah. So I think you do have to adapt, I think, in order for her to survive, that sort of starts to take place. And again, it's a very gradual thing. You can see in the film, it's, it is very, very gradual. It's only subtle. It was never supposed to be, okay, here I am, I'm a new woman now, um, because that's not real. Um, but I, I do think, it, I mean, yeah, to put to put it, I mean, basically it is down to the fact that we had a script and John knew what he was doing and he helped me and, you know, it's it becomes as simple as like reading a scene and understanding it, I think, and yeah. following your instinct. And all that goes back to the, the tone or the voice that Cullum wrote the novel in, which there's nothing self-conscious about it, you know, and, and that was one of the, and to go back to the original, what was the challenge of the film, was to try and make a film which was free of irony somehow and not be sentimental, to allow it to be emotional and direct and simple in order for the complication of the story <coughs> to really read on that screen, you know, and that was the thing, is that uh, you want her to transform and have it be incremental and almost unnoticed, unnoticed until there's a key point, like when she goes back to Ireland and suddenly looks like tiny steps, mm -hmm. looks like an awful long journey that she's been on, or maybe that scene on the deck at the very end, that there are key markers. But other than that, it should feel little bit by little bit by little bit. And you shouldn't really be aware that she's consciously choosing to change. She's not. She's sort of unfolding beautifully as a, as a person. But, there, but, but there's, there is a key marker in Nick's script where she's in the back of the car with the two rugby club guys, and she just announced that she doesn't like rugby club guys, <laughs> and she didn't miss them when she was away. And it's so cheeky. It's so ready for the world. You realize something now is going to happen. Sparks have to fly yeah. from this. I don't think that's in the book, actually, Nick. Um, so thank you very much for that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, you, know, you realize in that second when she just speaks to them as though she'll say whatever she likes yeah. now. Yeah, and mm. I don't that, care what you That you don't care what you think. You realize, oh, one of them is going to respond to this, and, and I know which one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And with that, I'm afraid we have to let our guests be whis whisked off. Thank you so much for your participation. And thank you, all of you, for a lovely film that I th think a lot of us feel is also our story. So have a blast on the red carpet tonight. <laughs> thank, thank, <laughs> thank you very thank much. You. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.